God is good. God is good. We've been for the last um, it's eighth Sunday now, seventh or eighth Sunday, in our Good God series, drawing on the teachings of Psalm 23, that, that God is a God in his goodness who provides, that he provides us rest. I love it that one of the first things that, that David says of God when, when um, he, he wrote this psalm is that he makes us lie down. Like the first thing he gives us is not a job to do, it's not an assignment, it's not a task, it's not go out and save the world, it's stop and rest. Rest. He replenishes us then. Green pastures, quiet waters, he restores our souls. He gives us direction, right? Trying to, we don't have to figure life out anymore. We don't have to find our own way. Guiding us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Protection. That we need not fear evil. Because he is with us. Because his rod and staff do comfort us. Promises us triumph, victory. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Abundance. Anointing to overflowing. Goodness and mercy all the days of our life and an eternal dwelling with him. God is good and God provides. And there are things that happen in the course of our journey through life that cast doubt on the goodness of God. That there are times that we walk through the valley of the shadow of death and it screams in those seasons, you're alone. God doesn't provide. God won't come through. All you have is you. In the um, week before Easter, Deb and I went out and, and saw the movie His Only Son. Anybody seen it yet? It's Abraham's story, Abraham and Sarah's story, and uh, culminates, I mean, it's really, the movie is about that, that final um, moment of testing Abraham's faith when God asks him to sacrifice his son Isaac. To me, I mean, there's a lot of really, really troubling stories that I find in the Bible. Right? I'm just like, what are you, you can't, you've got to be kidding me. How can this be what God is doing? And what God was asking, how can this happen in the world? There's a lot of troubling stories. But gratefully, for my part anyway, a lot of them are buried like in really obscure places in the Bible and texts and things that we don't come across often. It's like, whew, I'm glad people aren't reading that and coming to me and saying, hey, Tim, what about this? <laughs> but this is one that's not just like really troubling. It's kind of like one that everybody who's ever been around the church knows. Really? God asked that of Abraham. And it's an agonizing story. I'm not spoiling like any, uh, it's not a, uh, anything from the movie because you can go in the Bible and you can read pretty much the whole story is right there. So no need for a spoiler alert. During the movie, they, they flash back to, to other parts of the story, and it's just an absolutely agonizing journey, really from the time that God called Abraham to leave his family, his country, and begin this journey to this place that God was going to show him, but not really tell him where he was going. And these promises that he was going to give to Abraham, but no evidence over years upon years that that promise was actually being fulfilled. And it's an agonizing journey both for Abraham and for his wife, Sarah. But it's different for them. Because Abraham actually has a conversation with God. The Lord said to Abraham, and you see that, the Lord came to Abraham in a, in a vision, in a dream. The Lord spoke to Abraham. Sarah does not actually have conversations with Abraham she just gets to have a husband who comes to her and says, God told me. And she walks and trusts her husband. She follows him. But you can kind of see, like, there is a, Abraham gets a firsthand faith. And Sarah has a secondhand faith. Both are hard. But one is different than the other. And 
when this story unfolds, it's a different point in God's means, God's way of relating to his people. If you go back to the beginning of the story, you find in the Garden of Eden that God walks with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day, that he's present, that he's available to them. But when they're removed from the Garden of Eden, there's a shift in the way that God interacts with his people that takes place over the course of several centuries. God is no longer available to them on, on a regular daily basis, present to them. The God begins to, in this period of time, that he will pour out his spirit on a person, on an individual, for a specific time, for a specific reason, to, to accomplish a specific task. That he, that he has this way of, of using people like, like Noah and like Abraham and like Moses, like the prophets and the kings and the priests. And then these people become intermediate, intermediaries, become messengers. God tells them and then they tell his people. And so God tells Abraham and Abraham tells Sarah and tells the other people that are part of his family what God is telling him. And that pattern per persists, through, again, through centuries. But through a prophet that God has anointed with the Spirit, the prophet Joel, he says there is going to be a day when this means of my communication, my relationship with you is going to change again. In Joel chapter 2, he says, A day is coming when I will pour out my Spirit on all my people, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. There's coming a day through the prophet Joel that God says, it's not just going to be Abraham and Moses and David the prophets, the priests, all my sons and daughters will have first-hand access to me. A first-hand faith for everyone who follows me. So when Jesus comes onto the scene in John chapter 10, we looked at this several times, and says, I am the good shepherd. My sheep know me. They will recognize my voice. They will hear my voice and they will follow me because they know my voice. We have this firsthand kind of relationship, this kind of connection, a firsthand faith for everyone. Not just the preachers, the elders, all of his followers, a firsthand faith. We've been walking down this road for several, for several weeks, actually going back to January. And I want to pause for just a minute. Actually, we're, we're kind of pausing this Sunday, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. But I want to, I want to pause for just a minute. Someone, many of you have stories, and I, I honestly, I wish you would tell me more of them, of ways that God is speaking into your life. But Catherine Santani is one of the, uh, a member of our flock. She is actually an elder, but she's many other things beyond that. Uh, a mom, uh, a small group leader, uh, a, a saint, a sinner, all of those things. She shakes her head, um, sinner more than saint, um, very humble soul. But Catherine had an experience of God speaking to her, and, just, and he does it in such a variety of ways. I want Catherine to come up and tell you her story for just a second. Catherine? If you tell Tim a story, you might end up with a microphone, so. Don't <laughs> listen to her. Ignore that part. <laughs> Everything she else. <laughs> okay. I've had a lot of changes in my life in the last few years. Wonderful changes that have caused me to have a busy and often stressful schedule. Too often when I'm busy, I lose my focus on Jesus, and I try to get everything done myself. This leads to anxiety and sometimes some depression. I started thinking about a line in a movie in The Lord of the Rings where Bilbo Baggins tells Frodo that he feels thin like butter scraped over too much bread. I've never thought of that line in my life before, but it was how I was feeling. 
The following Sunday, Tim preached about space for God. It was exactly what I needed to hear. He quoted from a book by John Eldridge called Get Your Life Back, and I ordered it while I was sitting in church. <laughs> a few days later, I got the book and started the introduction. On page four, I read, but at the end of any given day, most people come home in a state of exhaustion, numb on good days, fried more often than we admit. But then there was a quote. I feel all thin, sort of stretched, as Bilbo Baggins said, like butter that has been scraped over too much bread. I read that quote, and I put the book down and cried, because, I was letting, because God was letting me know that he's always right here with me. Thanks, Catherine. I appreciate that. Right? Just in the most unexpected ways, God shows up. God speaks into our lives. It's important for us to remember, to watch, to expect so that we don't miss those things when they happen. I've been on a quest that really goes back to um, last summer, driven by, in some part, just need. So much has changed in the last few years in the world and in the church. And like I've been, I've been doing this for a long time now, and it just seems like the whole like landscape of, of life and ministry in the church has changed. And out of just a sense of need, God, I need, I need to not guess where I'm going. I need to not guess where and how I'm leading the church. I, I need to hear you speak more often. You do speak, but sometimes too far between one conversation and another. I, out of a sense of need, a desire to, to deepen this conversational intimacy with God. And, and part of it, the, this was driven by just... Um, discontent. Like, God, I, I want more. I desire more. I desire to, for this to be a, 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 a more conversational connection. And maybe even beyond that, driven by a desire to be a good shepherd in the service of a good shepherd. Then in shepherding you, in pastoring our congregation at the journey, our congregation that extends beyond these walls to people who um, live in other parts of the world now through the, the miracle of the internet, for you to have a firsthand faith, a faith more like Abraham's than like Sarah's, and maybe you sit here today and you say, well, I already do. And I hope so and I pray so and I'm glad that, if that's, that that's the case. But beyond that, right, you already do. But, but Paul talks about this experience of that you may be filled with, the, full, with the, the measure of all the fullness of God. So if you have this kind of first-hand conversational connection to God, if you have it already, is it full to all the measure of the fullness of God? Is there more there for you to learn and grow in? And I want that for you. And if it's, if it's true already, if like you are already full to all the measure of the fullness of God, our elders want to meet with you after church. They're going to fire me and they're going to hire you and I will sit under your leadership joyfully Right? If you're there, if you're, if you're already there. But I, I long for our journey family to have all the measure of the fullness of God. And in that vein, we started 2023 with what I called um, the Inside Out series. That, that we, our need is to... to not for behavior modification, right? The things that, that need fixed in our life. It, it's not, we don't need discipline first and foremost to correct our 
misdeeds and, and, and bad behaviors and bad habits, right? Most of us have things that we've tried to correct and, and made New Year's resolutions and, you know, vowed to, to, to do things differently and, and kind of come back to that same place over and over and over again of kind of just falling back into those same patterns, that our need is not for behavior modification, but for spiritual transformation. We need something to change us, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. Paul's prayer, that out of God's glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and high and long and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Inside out, in this pursuit a first-hand faith. And then we turned to Psalm 23. The sheep-shepherd relationship is a metaphor for the kind of relationship, this first-hand faith relationship that God desires for us to have. Jesus prays in John chapter 17 that we may be one that they may be one as we are one, Father, I in them, you in me. That, the, that Jesus' sheep would have the same kind of connection with Jesus, a oneness that Jesus had with his heavenly Father. He prayed that for you, for me. The same kind of relationship that he had with God that we would have with him in this oneness. One mind, one heart, one soul, one spirit. I, um, this week, as I'm thinking about and praying over where we go next, I went back through all of my sermons since the beginning of January um, through the Inside Out series and through... Um, the Good God series. And as I'm going through that, um, those, my sermon notes from every message, I was just struck by, my goodness, we have covered a lot of content, a lot of material. And, and as I'm reading through it, it's like, I kind of started feeling bad, like, man, I've just dumped way too much stuff on you way too fast. And maybe I need to circle back more often and kind of come back and say, oh, and remember this, and because I kind of think, um, this is just the way my mind works. I feel like I need to earn my keep. And to earn my keep, I need to keep giving you good stuff, you know, new stuff, because who needs old? You need new stuff and new stuff and new stuff and new stuff. And though sometimes we just need to hear some old things over and over and over and over again. And so today, I actually... I gave this message the title, Pause, which we'll come back to again, because I really, I just want to stop for a moment and pause, take a breath, and just highlight a few of the things that we've covered since January that I think are really, really helpful have been helpful for me and helpful for others as I see them practicing these things towards this oneness relationship with Jesus. Dallas Willard says, our deepest need, our deepest need is an enduring union with Jesus. Our deepest need is an enduring union, a oneness, a connection with Jesus. Our doubts and our disappointments discourage us in that pursuit. We've tried before. Maybe we've had some successes. Maybe we've started on a journey and, and lost our way again and failed too many times to the point where it's like, 
Do I even want to try again because I don't want to fail again? Do we go down this road again? Our doubts and our disappointments kind of derail us sometimes. The world distracts us. It is not your friend. The world is not your ally in this pursuit of a oneness with God. He's like, you carry these little things around in your hand. You have this computer that connects you to the entire world. And it's always telling you something other than other than God, other than his story. It'll tell you a story all day long about how the world is coming to an end and there's a zombie apocalypse right around the corner and, and how you know everything is falling apart. It's all there. It will tell you that you don't have enough, that you aren't enough, that, that other people has more and somehow you've been left out or somehow you've missed out. It'll tell you all kinds of things, but it will not tell you unless you look for it that the Lord is your shepherd. The world is not our ally. And we have an enemy, and he deceives us with lies and accusation and condemnation. Maybe you heard it this morning. Maybe you heard Catherine share her story and think, that is so cool. I wish God would sometime do something like that with me. But that'll never happen. It's a lie. It can happen. It will happen. As we listen, as we seek, as we cry out, Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. He says, if you remain in me, which suggests that there's something that we need to do, right? That this relationship that he's calling us to, like, honestly, like all relationships do, right? Do you have any relationships that don't require something of you? You're focus your attention if you remain in me. He's calling us back to all the places that we take our thirst for life. He's saying, come, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Because our deepest need is an enduring union with Jesus, Dallas Willard says, we must arrange our days so we are experiencing deep contentment, joy, and confidence in our everyday life with God. Structure our days for this relationship. And so we went, have been going through Psalm 23. When we started Psalm 23, my goal was this, not to give you great, eight great sermons on the 23rd Psalm. Not at all. It's not, it wasn't even like, my, my goal when we started Psalm 23 was pure and simple. I wanted you to memorize Psalm 23. Because I want you to know Psalm 23 so that in the course of your life, at any given moment, on any given day, when you start to feel like you're losing yourself, you can say, whoa, whoa, whoa. But the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. We're going to keep working on this, okay? Because what I realized is I spent like five weeks on the first half of the psalm. And then because of the way the schedule fell out, we hit Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Easter Sunday, and we covered the last half of the psalm in eight days. I want you to know it in your mind and repeat it so often that it begins to take root in your heart as a confession of faith. We talked in our Inside Out series about consecrating our mental life to God. To not be conformed 
to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. To fix our thoughts, as Paul says, on whatever is noble, true, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, to think about those things, to capture every thought and make it obedient to Christ, right? A thought comes into your head and says, no, not you. Why? Why not? Why not you? A thought comes into your head and says, because you are a failure. Because you did that or you said that or you thought that. Bring that thought captive to Christ. What does the scripture say? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. To bring every thought, to consecrate our mental life to God. To rein in speculation, right? The things that are the thoughts that take us down rabbit trails that lead us into horrible places. Jesus says, do not worry. Worry is like, that that is worry by definition. It's thinking about the future in a negative context and saying, if I go down, you know, this is where it's going to end up. What's our story? To know the truth. What's the truth? The Lord is your shepherd. You're not alone. You don't have to find your own way. To consecrate our mental life to God. To consecrate our emotional life to God. Emotional baggage, unattended sorrows, those traumas and dramas that are in our life that we just shove down. They close off parts of our heart. They get sealed in there. Jesus says the most important commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul all your strength. How do we love God with all of our hearts if 85% of our heart is blocked off so that we don't have to deal with the fear or the shame or the pain or the guilt of the past? Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, if you allow me in, I will come in and I will clean house. He says, I'll come in and have dinner with you. I'll come in and we'll, we'll, we'll eat together. I'm gentle, humble. You will find rest for your souls. To invite him into those places that we're inclined to shut him out to ground ourselves in the love of Christ, being rooted, established in love. I think one of the things is that we've talked about during the Inside Out series that's been really helpful for me is this idea of remembering the goodness of God. That every, everything that exists, James says, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Do you want to know if God loves you? He gave you the ocean and the mountains and the trees and every beautiful flower that you've ever loved and every rock that you've ever picked up off the beach. His gift to you because he sees you and he knows you and he loves you. We have all kinds of things around us that are screaming something else. But to ground ourselves in the love and to receive those things as gifts from our Heavenly Father. And above all else, the gift that we celebrated last week in Jesus' death for the forgiveness of our sins and his resurrection to raise us with him to new life in Christ. To remember his love and his goodness. Early on in the, pa- in the um, Inside Out series, I gave you, I introduced you to the Pause app. Anybody using the Pause app? Anybody tried it and 
lost it, and got away from it a couple times, and come back to it, right? Cool. One-minute pause, three-minute pause, five-minute pause. I started using the pause app back in 2019 when it first came out. Used it through the first half of the, to, of the pandemic. Really helpful. I mean, just, you know, using it on a regular basis, I one-minute, three-minute pauses, helped me just kind of come back to that place. And then it's just kind of got, yeah, okay, you know. It wasn't having the same impact. And I stopped for a while. And then I came back to it, and it was helpful again, and I stopped for a while. I came back to it. And and stopped for a long time. Since January, I've um, used the pause app every morning. The first thing I do when I come to my office and sit down at my desk is I do a five minute pause. Every time I come to my office. And Deb and I, during that Insights Out series, started every single night. The last thing we do when we go to bed is we turn on five minute pause and we listen to it before we go to sleep, or sometimes we fall asleep before it's over. But it's the last thing that we do in our day. And this is what I can tell you is happening. Not because every pause is like some revolutionary experience, but this is what's happening that I'm starting to see. Is just the pattern and the repetition is starting to filter its way into other times in my life and other experiences when things happen that before I'm even thinking about the pause app, it's pressing, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. It's not 100% a default response yet. Let's say it's a 23% default response. But 23% is better than 2%. It's a pattern. to release everything to God, to reconnect with him in this union that we may be one with him as he is with the Father and to ask for the fullness of God to fill us up again. Now think about it, right? If more and more of your experience of those moments when the wheels start to feel like they come off, that your response, your brain goes to not down the rabbit trail, but to hold on. The Lord's my shepherd. Hold on. These things that I'm taking on here, I, I don't have control over them. I can't fix them. I can't make them right. I can, can't make them better. God, I'm going to give them to you. I'm not, not in a sense like, ah, throw out my hands. I hope the stuff falls where it may. No, hand, taking the stuff and handing it into the hands of your heavenly father and saying, I can't do this. I'm letting you have it. And what I want from you, God, is a connection with you so that now out of your fullness, wherever I go from here, I'm not going on my own, but with you in me and through me. To pause. If, um, if you've used it, I want to commend it to you again. If you've gotten off of it, I want you to go back and try it again. And I want you to get to the one minute and the three minute. The way the app works is you have to do a one minute pause a few times before you can get to the three minute. And then you do the three minute a few times and it'll open up, up the five minute. And then you do the five minute a few times and it will open up a whole other reservoir. There's actually a, a mental um, uh, consecration of your mental life to God five minute pause which I also find really helpful just to, to walk you through when I talked about the, the, the mental, um, consecrating your mental life to God. It will, it will walk you through that process. Really helpful. There's actually in there, if you're really, really ambitious, and I commend it to you as well, a 30-day journey, 10-minute pause in the morning, 10-minute pause in the evening. It will walk you through a whole process uh, of a 30-day a, a experience that is aimed at exactly what I'm talking about. A deeper conversational intimacy, connection, relationship, union with God. 
What you need more than anything else, Dallas Willard says, and I agree, is an enduring union with Jesus. To have that, we must arrange our days. And I'm not doing it in 20 minute or 45 minute or hour. I'm doing it in one minute and three minute and five minute segments. But three or five, seven times a day. Because I don't want to just connect with God in the morning and then run on my own for the rest of the day or connect with God on Sunday and run on my own for the rest of the week. Daily bread. I eat three meals a day. I snack in between every one of those meals. What do you need, right? One meal a week, one meal a day, three meals a day, some snacks. My prayer for our church, my prayer for our church is an Abraham faith a first-hand faith for daily bread, for the fullness, the me- all the measure of the fullness of God. God, I pray the name of Jesus over all who are gathered in the sanctuary today and over all who are watching online this morning. I pray the name of Jesus that brings hope and life and freedom and joy and direction and strength and rescue and healing and restoration and renewal and peace. Pray the name of Jesus over every heart and every life. I pray a deeper desire, a deeper hunger and thirst for righteousness that brings us back to you again and again and again and again and again. Because we're experiencing you and we're seeing your life grow up in us And because we're not. And we know that we need it so desperately. Speak the name of Jesus for every heart and every life.